We've been talking about the expansion of the universe. Uh, and uh, in answer, I, I want to follow up on something I said kind of in answer to uh, uh, a question last time, which is uh, that it turns out that the expansion of the universe alone doesn't uh, require you to have a Big Bang. Uh, there's other explanations, or in particular, one other class of explanation uh, which is compatible with the observation of the expanding universe, but doesn't exactly uh, lead to a Big Bang in the sense that uh, we think of it today. And so I want to talk about these alternatives. Uh, this is uh, Frontiers and Controversies as of 1950. Uh, in 1920, you'll recall they were worried about whether the spiral nebulae were island galaxies of their own or not. That was settled by Hubble's observation. In the 1950s, uh, it had become clear that it really is true that the universe is expanding, uh, but there were two categories of explanation that were being put forward uh, to explain that, and uh, deciding which is which was the current uh, big topic of the day. So uh, the universe expands. And what do we make of this fact? Well, one option is uh, the Big Bang, what we now uh, call the Big Bang, which, as I've mentioned, implies that in the past everything was closer together, it was denser, uh, and that creates other changes. If things get denser, they also get hotter, you may remember from chemistry. So uh, this implies in the past. Uh, things were different from how they are now. They were denser, hotter, uh, uh, and uh, that in the future uh, it'll go the other way. Uh, things will become sparser and cooler, uh, and there may be other changes associated with this. Uh, there may be different kinds of galaxies in the past from now and, in, and different kinds of galaxies now as compared to the future and so forth. That the universe uh, is a place whose bulk properties can change in time. So things change uh, in time. And the implication is that you can extrapolate this back to an initial singularity. That there was a moment at some point in the past where uh, all uh, currently existing space was piled up in a single point. This is uh, the way I talked about this last time was that the scale factor was equal to zero. Uh, and so there is this implication of uh, an initial singularity. Now, this is not the initial singularity is not the kind of thing that can be verified scientifically because all the physical laws break down the same way they do in the singularity inside a black hole or an event horizon or something like that. Uh, but nevertheless, that's the implication, that's the extrapolation of uh, this set of ideas. But uh, at least at the time, that was not the only set of ideas that could explain uh, this expansion. There was an alternative which was uh, described as the steady state. I should say that both of these names were given uh, to these ideas by people who supported the steady state. Uh, Big Bang uh, was, uh, uh, that phrase was used as an insult by the steady state people to make fun of uh, the ideas of the Big Bang, which we now actually know to be correct. And that's why that particular phrase uh, is, in a way, so misleading, uh, that they were deliberately trying to uh, obscure and uh, uh, insult some of the ideas in the Big Bang. Uh, from time to time, uh, astronomical organizations and popular magazines run contests to rename the great theory and come up with some better name that won't give you in your mind the impression of an explosion coming out from some central point. Uh, and uh, people send in suggestions, and it never gets anywhere. Uh, we're stuck with the Big Bang. Uh, but it is good to remember that it was named by its opponents who supported the steady state. So how would this work? Uh, the idea, the central idea here is that new, uh, the universe ex expands, but then new matter and energy is created uh, to uh, fill 
in the void. The voids as the universe expands. So sure, all galaxies are moving away from us, but new galaxies are being created where the old galaxies used to be. And the consequence of that is that the past and the future both uh, have uh, similar bulk characteristics. The density, the overall density is the same, uh, and other uh, characteristics are the same. Because as things move further away, you simply replace them with other things like them. And so uh, uh, you, know, you have to kind of invent uh, some way of creating matter and energy, uh, but that's not nearly as bad as creating a whole universe, which is what you have to do uh, in the case of the, uh, uh, of the Big Bang. So uh, in this case, the past and the future are the same. The, it, it also implies that the universe is eternal in contrast to the Big Bang, where there's this initial moment, which uh, one then instantly asks, well, how did that happen and what happened before it? So we get around that. This is an eternal process. Uh, and uh, it's also infinite. Uh, and so we don't have to start asking these awkward questions about what's outside the universe. And so people found this, uh, uh, in some ways, much more satisfying. Uh, and so there were these two <coughs> quite different explanations of the observed fact that the universe was expanding. Now, the historians of science who uh, have studied this controversy, some of them make the claim uh, that which side you ended up on in the 1950s before there was a lot of evidence either way, this was kind of a philosophical rather than a scientific question at the time, uh, that which side you ended up here uh, depended largely on uh, your religious beliefs or lack thereof. And they document this. The, the, a lot of the work on the Big Bang and a lot of the supporters of the Big Bang uh, were, as I mentioned last time, uh, <coughs> Catholics. In one important case, the, this guy Lemaitre, who worked out all the equations, was in <coughs> fact a Catholic priest, uh, also a physicist in his spare time. Uh, and uh, this is a nice uh, kind of idea because it give from that point of view because it gives you this initial moment of creation. Uh, which is, uh, uh, if you're a religious person, it's relatively <coughs> easy to come up with a reason why that might have happened. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of the scientists, particularly uh, in Britain, where the steady state was uh, uh, largely developed, were of a kind of atheistic or agnostic turn of mind. And they didn't like this initial singularity. And they liked the idea of an eternal, infinite universe, as actually Einstein did too, uh, because uh, uh, you didn't have to have a creation event, and you didn't uh, have to invoke the kinds of uh, ideas that come along with that. Uh, and uh, uh, there's some dispute over, over how much this really mattered to people, but what was clear is in the 1950s, this was not a question for which there was scientific evidence either way. And so what the scientific evidence said was that the universe expanded, and then you could follow either of these arrows. Interestingly, however, uh, these two hypotheses make quite different predictions, which in the end turned out to be testable. A and in particular, um, what, it, uh, what it predicted, if the Big Bang predicts, uh, makes this very strong prediction that the past is fundamentally different looking uh, from the present. Now. Uh, over the course of a human lifetime, this isn't going to make a lot of difference. Uh, the uh, galaxies don't get that much further away from us uh, in 20 or 30 years. But, it, uh, but one can actually look into the past by looking at things that are far away. This is because the speed of light is <coughs> finite. When we look at the sun, we don't see the sun as it is right now. We see the sun as it was eight minutes ago when the light started to travel toward us, because the sun is eight <coughs> light minutes, minutes away. If we look at Alpha Centauri, the nearest star other than the sun, uh, if Alpha Centauri uh, blew up or disappeared or something right now, we wouldn't know about it for four years, because it's four light years away. Uh, similarly, if we look at a, a uh, a galaxy that's 10 megaparsecs away, a megapars uh, parsec is three light years, so a megaparsec is uh, three million light years. Uh, some galaxy that's 10 
uh, that's 10, light, uh, 10 megaparsecs away, that's 30 million light years away. So we're seeing it not as it is, but as it was 30 million years ago. Now it turns out that in the, in the course of cosmic time, a few million years here or, here, here, here or there doesn't make any difference to anybody. Uh, but once you get into billions, <coughs> now you're talking cosmic time. Uh, and so if you look at things that are billions of light years away, that turns out to be a substantial fraction of the age of the universe predicted by the Big Bang. We'll get back a little later in this lecture to how you determine what the age of the universe is supposed to be. But if you go back a substantial fraction of the age of the universe, if you look back uh, that uh, uh, over distances that great, then you predict that you ought to see things that look different from the galaxies you see today because the universe at that time was denser and hotter and the galaxies were younger on average and, and you ought to be able to see some kinds of differences. So the past is different from the present and this is observable uh, through uh, this concept of the look back time. Uh, just the fact that the further away something is, the longer it's taken the light to travel you, to you, and so you're actually seeing things not as they are right now, but as they are in the past. And so you can imagine a great research project where you sort of look at nearby galaxies to see how things are in the current day. Then you look at really, really distant ones, some substantial fraction of the age of the universe ago, and you ask yourself the question, are those galaxies the same as the galaxies that exist today, or are they in some sense different? Uh, so that's a testable prediction. There's also a testable prediction on this side, which is that you ought to actually be able to find these places where the new matter and energy is being created, because that's a constant ongoing process. It has to be, because it's got to fill in uh, the empty spaces left behind by the expanding galaxies. So the prediction over here that is that there exists uh, places of matter and energy creation. So this is potentially testable. And in the 1960s, evidence was actually found that kind of decided this question, which is why we now no longer believe in the steady state. And two things uh, happened. Actually, there were a number of things that happened. Uh, but one of them was the discovery of what were called quasars. Uh, these are now known to be uh, accreting supermassive black holes, but they didn't know that then. So this is in the 1960s. That's what we think they are now, but they didn't know it then. All they knew is that they had discovered uh, a, a great source uh, of huge amounts of energy. And you'd think that this would be a very good thing, uh, uh, some kind of unknown energy source would be just the thing uh, for the steady state people because that's what they needed. They needed this some kind of source of mass energy creation and indeed uh, that was claimed for a little while. These things, uh, the main characteristic of these things is that they have very high redshifts, uh, which implies very large distances uh, because uh, uh, Velocity is proportional to distance. That's the Hubble law. Everybody agreed that the Hubble law was right. So these things were known to be large distances away. Uh, and so if you're a steady state person, you say, well, that's great. If they're so far away, they must be incredibly bright. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to see them. And th there's, our, uh, there's our energy source that we require. Uh, if you're a Big Bang person, what you say is, ah, now we finally found a bunch of things that are really far away. And we can ask the question, are things that are that far away the same as in the local universe? Or are they different? And what it turned out, uh, one of the very first things that was discovered is that there were many more uh, quasars in the past than there are now. Uh, and so whatever they are, supermassive black holes or, or whatever hypothesis you have for these things, it turns out they're dying out. There were more of them in the past than there are now. They were brighter. Uh, and so here is an example of a significant change in the composition of the universe. Uh, which is the thing that's predicted by the Big Bang? And so 
uh, although initially it looked like quasars might be helpful to the steady state, as soon as they started to get enough of them so you could do these kinds of statistical tests, it became the first really strong evidence that the universe was changing in time. This was not the only thing that was discovered in the 1960s. Another thing uh, is the so-called cosmic microwave background. And we'll talk much more about that uh, later on. Right now, uh, I just want to say that what this is, is it's uh, radiation that was created, uh, that was generated when the universe was, uh, when uh, the universe was much denser than it is now. Uh, much hotter than it is now. In fact, uh, it comes from its radiation emitted by ionized hydrogen. So this is when the whole universe was at 10,000 degrees or so Kelvin, uh, obviously much hotter than the universe is right now, and much smoother. All this hydrogen, rather than being uh, locked up in, in individual stars or in in, or, and stars uh, concentrated in individual galaxies, all this hydrogen was very smoothly distributed around space. Uh, and uh, so this came from a time, this radiation, which you can, uh, which you can easily detect with radio telescopes and the like, uh, comes from a time when the universe was much denser, hotter, and smoother than it is today, again, in accordance with, uh, 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 with the predictions of the Big Bang. So this, is, this provided very strong support for the Big Bang. And uh, the discoverers of this uh, have got, uh, there have been Nobel Prizes given out on a regular basis for uh, uh, discoveries related to the cosmic microwave background. And as I say, we'll come back, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that at some length later on. Uh, another thing that was discovered is that the universe is pretty clearly uh, mostly three quarters hydrogen and one quarter helium. Just about every cosmic object you see, not the Earth, but the solar system as a whole has, that, uh, uh, has those proportions, and all stars have these proportions, and all galaxies consist of stars that have these proportions. And it turns out this could be explained by the Big Bang. Uh, when it was uh, denser, hotter, and smoother, uh, uh, in the early universe, it was hot enough for hydrogen fusion. Hydrogen fusion into helium. Uh, but it didn't last very long because the universe was expanding and cooling, and you need to have very high temperatures in order to have hydrogen fusion. That's why it can only happen in the center of the sun or in an atomic bomb explosion or something like that. Uh, and so uh, the universe for about three minutes was hot enough for hydrogen to fuse. And if you ask yourself what fraction of the hydrogen fused during the time the universe uh, was hot enough for that to occur, the answer turns out to be about a quarter of it, in exact agreement with uh, the currently observed <coughs> fractions of hydrogen and helium in the universe. So this is uh, in First Three Minutes. There's a famous popular book from the 1980s called The First Three Minutes, which discusses this by Steven Weinberg. Uh, in the first three minutes, one quarter of hydrogen uh, fuses into helium. And afterwards, no more because it's too cool for these reactions to occur. So that was another piece of evidence that uh, the, the, uh, the Big Bang was the right explanation and the uh, 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 steady state was not. Yes, question? Is it accurate three minutes or is that just representing Sorry? Is it accurate three minutes? Uh, so uh, if you start from time zero when everything is put together, after three minutes the universe has cooled sufficiently so that you can't have hydrogen fusion generally. Then no, no more nuclear reactions occur until much, much later when stars form. And we know how fast the universe is expanding because we, uh, uh, we can measure the Hubble constant now. Uh, and so you know how long it takes for the universe to expand uh, to the point where the temperature drops enough so that there's no general hydrogen fusion anymore. And then you do this little calculation of how much fuses during that time. Other questions? OK. Um, more recently, with the Hubble Space Telescope and other, other big ground-based telescopes, uh, 
we've discovered uh, that you, you can now see galaxies that are very far away, that are uh, as they were a substantial fraction of the, uh, of the age of the universe ago. Uh, and by now it's clear that galaxies uh, evolve and that the statistical demographics of galaxies, how many there are, how massive they are, how big they are, all those kinds of things, that those statistics change dramatically uh, over the course of the universe, over the course of the amount of look back time that we can, uh, that we can currently observe. Uh, so galaxies evolve uh, uh, very significantly. So everything points uh, toward the Big Bang and away from the steady state. Uh, much to the surprise of uh, a lot of the scientists who felt, uh, uh, possibly correctly given what was known in the 1950s, that the steady state was a much more elegant solution. Uh, and so, let's see, the fable here is uh, the demise of the steady state. Uh, and the moral, well, there are various morals to this, uh, but let me be provocative and say uh, that sometimes uh, science uh, is anti atheistic. Atheistic not anti-religious. Uh, because it could have come out the other way, right? Uh, it could have turned out that the steady state was right, and then you wouldn't have had this, uh, 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 then you wouldn't have had this uh, moment of creation, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and you wouldn't, uh, and, and uh, Pope John Paul II wouldn't have been so enthusiastic about astrophysics. In just the same way that it might have turned out that human beings are fundamentally different from all other species of animals. Uh, and if that had been true, uh, the geneticists would have discovered that instead of what they did discover. And so uh, uh, there's a feeling, particularly in current political debates, that science is somehow intrinsically anti-religious. Uh, and I think that isn't true. It's not. It. it, it it, it isn't one way or another. It's just a way of finding stuff out. And sometimes, as in this particular case, uh, you might find out uh, that the atheists, or whatever the atheists had proposed, uh, is wrong. And that's actually what happened in this particular case. Uh, so the demise of the steady state is uh, 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 one of the big things that happened in the latter half of the 20th century. And so now, uh, the scientific evidence uh, is very, very strongly in favor of the Big Bang. Uh, I should define what I mean, I think, by the Big Bang Theory, because as I said, this is a phrase coined by its enemies. Uh, and it's one of these phrases like black hole, which actually doesn't have a technical definition. Uh, and uh, you get into trouble by people using it in different ways. Uh, and so uh, if, uh, if what you mean by this is that in the past, the universe was denser and hotter and smoother because it's it's constantly you know forming new stars and galaxies everything is 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 getting more lumpy with time uh, and that you can extrapolate this to an initial singularity then I think uh, then I think there's extremely strong scientific uh, uh, evidence in favor of this. But you have to keep your eye on this word extrapolate, because sometimes the Big Bang is used, uh, is used to uh, describe this moment of initial uh, uh, creation, or whatever you want to call it, this, this initial moment of, uh, of infinite density and somehow everything uh, uh, starting to expand. There's, uh, you can't observe that. That's, a, that's one of these things that you can't see uh, now or you know, with our current theories at any point in, uh, in the future. And so that's an extrapolation. That's not an observation. And that's a fundament <coughs> fundamentally uh, different thing. So if you use Big Bang to indicate that particular moment, then you can say that the scientific evidence for the actual, that actual moment isn't, uh, uh, isn't strong and indeed couldn't even exist uh, within our current 
current theories because because all of physics breaks down there. Uh, and so what you mean when what what I mean when I say that there's a lot of scientific support for the Big Bang is there's support for this idea that the universe is changing in time. It was denser, hotter, and smoother in the past, and that if you extrapolate this back, there was an initial singularity some number of years ago, and you can actually figure out how many years ago that was, which is what I'm about to do next. Uh, and so this uh, is now the kind of currently accepted theory. I should say uh, there are a few remnant holdouts from the steady state type uh, who uh, uh, annoy the rest of us by not giving in. Uh, and uh, there's actually been some interesting controversy over the years about uh, you know, how much telescope time do you give to people whose proposal is to look for the places where mass is created in the steady state theory. Uh, if nobody else believes that theory anymore. Uh, and uh, 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 by now, the answer is none, uh, but it took quite a while to get to that point. Okay. Do people ever lie about what they're going to observe? Oh, do people lie about what they're going <laughs> to observe? Excellent. <laughs> the, the graduate students are amused. Uh, no, what happens is this. Uh, you have to present, so you have to write these proposals because the telescopes are oversubscribed. And you have to come up with a plausible thing that you're going to do. Uh, <coughs> now, it then, it then varies how this, how this uh, is actually done in operation. In the space telescope, for example, what you have to do is then you fill out what's called a phase two form, which tells exactly where the space telescope is supposed to point and for how long, and you submit that, and they upload it, and they do it. If you deviated drastically from the target list you gave them when they approved your proposal, uh, that'll get flagged, and they won't do it. Uh, on the other hand, on ground-based telescopes, you kind of go to the telescope, and still in many cases, you operate it yourself. And there's not a lot of control over where you point the thing. The control then happens later. Uh, one of the key components of a proposal for telescope time is what you did with the data you got from the last amount of telescope time they gave you. And you know you have to list all the publications, or if you haven't actually gotten around to publishing anything, which is usually the case with me recently, uh, you have to show little little graphs uh, 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 or you know describe the data and what you're going to do with it and so forth. And uh, one of the things I, I, I sit on these committees that make these kinds of decisions and one of the things you look for is if they haven't done interesting work and kind of done what they claimed they would do the last time around, uh, their proposal goes down to the bottom. You're always looking for ways to trash other people's proposals uh, because you've got seven times more, in the case of the Space Telescope, you've got seven times more proposals than you can grant, of which only a small handful are not worth doing. Uh, and so any opportunity you have to say, you know, these guys are bozos, uh, you definitely take that opportunity because otherwise you have way too many good proposals left over. So there's a kind of internal control that isn't uh, explicit uh, on this sort of thing. And after a while, you know, if people keep getting up in public and saying, you know, quasars are sources of mass energy creation that and therefore support the, the steady state, even if they're a great big quasar expert, uh, you start to get a little bit queasy about giving them large amounts of telescope time that might be uh, more profitably used by someone else. This then gets interpreted by the uh, uh, remnant steady state supporters or whoever the, the minority idea might be of a hugely oppressive scientific bureaucracy, you know, not allowing the maverick wonderful thinker to do their own thing. Uh, and that sometimes is true, uh, but not often. Most of the time, it's the sane people not allowing the insane people to use the telescopes. Uh, and that's actually a much more common thing. And so while it can be good propaganda to say, yeah, these uh, oppressive, uh, elitist, uh, 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 you know, bureaucratic, uh, uh, people, mafia who run the scientific world are not allowing my great idea to, have to, 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 to get any uh, opportunities to prove itself. Uh, most of the time, it turns out the establishment is right. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there is this interesting question about allocation of resources. It's not just telescope time, more importantly, even money. Uh, there's a big debate right now, for example, in the theoretical physics community about string theory. String theory is the hot theory of everything. Uh, and uh, everybody 
uh, is supposed to be a string theorist in theoretical physics at the moment, except for a few people who point out that it hasn't actually been all that successful in explaining anything. In fact, it hasn't explained anything ever. Uh, and therefore, might one not want to consider alternative theories? And then the strength theorists say, but you know, uh, this is a really good idea. We've got to continue to look at it. One day we'll get it right and we'll figure out everything. Uh, and uh, so there has now recently been some popular books that claim that string, that string theorists, theorists are oppressing everybody else by not letting uh, other kinds of good ideas be funded uh, and uh, uh, by uh, not letting smart young people who are working on other things by not hiring them into departments and so forth. Uh, it's an interesting argument uh, and uh, uh, ongoing in the string theory community. It's sort of, as I said, they've been writing popular books on both sides of this, so it's kind of busted out into, you can read about this now in the New York Review of Books and places like that. Uh, and uh, so what you do about minority ideas, ideas that are not supported by uh, the current paradigm of uh, a, a given scientific subject is a, is a very tricky one and a very interesting one and one that needs to be reevaluated from time to time. And in fact, uh, cosmology may be approaching such a moment where a genuinely new idea I is going to have to be required. Uh, we, we're probably not quite there yet, but we'll talk about uh, uh, alternative cosmological theories toward, toward the end of the course. Um, sorry, I didn't uh, uh, mean to go off on this, but, but uh, 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 it's on my mind because, as I said, I serve on these committees, so you have to think about these things. Actually, the Space Telescope people did a very interesting thing. At one point, they decided, uh, I don't think they ever actually followed through on this, that 5% or some small amount of the time, different scientific uh, 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 resources sometimes have this, that like 5% of the time goes for risky science. Science that's really weird, probably won't work, but if it works, it's incredibly important. Because uh, committees tend not to want to do that. Uh, they tend to want to do the things that they know are going to uh, produce some good result. And so sometimes uh, the people who organize these things force the committees uh, to have a little category of special weird projects. Uh, and then, of course, what happens? Five years later, they, ana they analyze, you know, where did all the good science come from? Uh, and if it didn't come from the weird projects, which is almost certainly the case, uh, although not 100% certainly the case, but generally the case, then they say, look, we wasted 5% of our money, telescope time, whatever it is, we're going to close down this program. And then you kind of have to start over again. Uh, so how weird is weird? Uh, uh, difficult to say. All right. The expansion of the universe. We now believe, uh, for the reasons I outlined, that this indicates uh, a kind of Big Bang idea, which means we can extrapolate back uh, to the moment that it all started. And we can calculate how long it took. Uh, let me do a simpler calculation, uh, but exactly analogous. Uh, supposing you're in a car. You're in a car, and you're driving at a speed of 50 miles per hour, uh, and you are 100 miles away from your starting point. How long have you been driving? So this they taught you how to solve in seventh grade. Uh, if you are... Uh, 100 miles away, you, you, you take time is equal to distance over velocity. Uh, so 100 miles, you're going 50 miles an hour. Uh, that means you must have been going for two hours. Not such a hard problem. Uh, there's a hidden assumption, though. Sorry? Speed is constant, yeah. Providing, provided that the speed is constant. OK, but let's make that assumption. Let's assume that the universe is expanding at the same rate uh, all the time. How, uh, how long has it been going? Well, take some galaxy, any galaxy. It turns out it doesn't matter which galaxy. And say, uh, so galaxy uh, A is at distance d. It's moving at 
velocity v away from us. You know, that's the whole idea. Uh, so how long has it been since it was right on top of us? Well, so it's been going for a time equal to d over v. By exact analogy with the, the distance uh, uh, velocity time questions that they ask you about, you know, cars driving to Cleveland and stuff. Uh, so it's been going for time t equals d over v. But now, in the case of galaxies, there's this interesting relationship that v is equal to h over d. So d over v is equal to 1 over h. Okay? And that can be measured. That's Hubble's constant. And so the age of the universe is equal to 1 over the Hubble constant, provided that the expansion has been at a constant rate. Uh, r let me remind you, h is, is, uh, has been measured. It's 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. That's kind of an interesting unit. Uh, you've got kilometers per megaparsec. Both of those are measures of distance. Uh, this is basically velocity over distance. Uh, and, uh, but velocity contains a distance within it. So uh, if you were to cancel those two distance terms in some way, uh, you'd have that the units of the Hubble constant are 1 over seconds. So the units of 1 over the Hubble constant are seconds. It's a measure of time. Uh, it's, it's reciprocal time. 1 over h is a measure of time. What is that time? It's the age of the universe. What do I mean by the age of the universe? That's how long it has been since all galaxies and all objects in the universe, all points in the universe, were piled on top of one another. Yes? Uh, let's see. Did I write it wrong? Uh, v equals... Yeah, yeah, I wrote it wrong. V equals hd. Thank you. Uh, and so now what am I going to do? I'm going to divide both sides by h. I'm going to divide both sides by v, and then it comes out right. Sorry, thank you very much. Uh, stop me when I do that. Uh, right, because this is the Hubble law. OK, so how old is the universe? Well, it's uh, 1 over 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Uh, that actually is not a very useful unit of time. Uh, so l let's see if we can do better. Uh, h is equal to 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Now we want to cancel the kilometers per megaparsec. So what we want to multiply this by is the number of megaparsecs in 1 kilometer. That's a very small number, right? It's, it's some tiny fraction, because a megaparsec is huge. Uh, it's uh, uh, you know, 3 million light years or something like that, and a kilometer, not so huge. Uh, so let's calculate this term. That's going to be 1 <coughs> kilometer is 10 to the 3 meters. Uh, 1 megaparsec, a mega is 10 to the 6. A parsec is 3 times 10 to the 16 meters. Uh, and so this is equal to 1 third times 10 to the minus 22, 10 to the minus 19 is equal to uh, 3 times 10 to the minus 20, right? Uh, but it's 70 of those. So h is equal to 7 times 10 to the 1 times 3 times 10 to the minus 20, which is equal to 20 times 10 to the minus 19, or 2 times 10 to the minus 18. Uh, in units of 1 over seconds. So 1 over h, we now know in seconds, is equal to 1 over 2 times 10 to the minus 18 seconds. That's uh, a half times 10 to the 18, or 5 times 10 to the 17 seconds. One year is equal to 3 times 10 to the 7 seconds. So the age of the universe in years is uh, 5 times 10 to the 17 over 3 times 10 to the 7, uh, which is something like uh, 1.7 times 10 to the 10, or 17 billion. 
years. So that's the answer. The universe is 17 billion years old. Uh, it's not quite the answer because of that assumption, right? The assumption was that the universe is expanding at the same rate uh, uh, all the time. And that's not necessarily true. Uh, and the next thing we're going to do is ask the question, uh, what happens if the expansion rate of the universe changes with time? It probably does. It almost certainly does. Uh, because the universe is filled with mass. What does mass do? Mass exerts, uh, well, Newton would have it that mass exerts gravitational force. It slows down the expansion of the universe. So what do you expect? You expect the universe to be slowing down gradually. Uh, and this uh, gives rise to a couple of possibilities. And I think I mentioned this briefly in passing. Now we're going to do it uh, more, uh, in more detail. This is the scale factor of the universe, uh, which started at zero. Uh, here's time. Here's now. Uh, here's whatever the scale factor of the universe is now. Uh, and uh, uh, what has happened? Here's Here's, here's what it looks like if there's no change. So this is constant expansion. And so uh, it is this amount of time that turns out to be 17 billion years. Uh, but in fact, it's, uh, uh, it, it seems likely that the universe is in fact slowing down. So what does that look like? Well, that means that in the future it's going to do this. Uh, that means that in the past it was doing this uh, because it was, it's presumably been slowing down since the very beginning. And that means that the universe is uh, started uh, later than you think because it, it started expanding more quickly than it is now. And then it's been slowing down. So in fact, you might say uh, the that what we've really shown is that the universe has to be less than 17 billion years old. By the way, this calculation is why it was such bad news when Hubble got the answer wrong. Uh, you recall uh, from the problem set, Hubble thought that the uh, Hubble constant was 500 kilometers per second per megaparsec. 500 is a bigger number. It means uh, it, it's, it's uh, uh, what, seven times bigger than we currently believe. That means that uh, Hubble's estimate of the age of the universe was a factor of seven smaller than uh, uh, 17 billion years, which is about two and a half billion years. So Hubble's, the implication of Hubble's result uh, for the Big Bang, in the Big Bang context at least, was that the universe was two and a half billion years old. That was very bad news because the geologists had already figured out that the Earth was four billion years old. Uh, and it's not good news to have a planet that's a factor of two older than the universe. Uh, and so this was part of the initial suspicion of the Big Bang explanation. Part of the reason people uh, uh, tried to develop steady state ideas was that Hubble's uh, calculation of the constant gave you an age of the universe that was in contradiction uh, to existing uh, geological ages measured on Earth. Uh, by now, we're up to 17 billion years, and that seems to, uh, 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 that's fine. The, universe, uh, the, the Earth is only four and a half billion years old, so there's no conflict there anymore. There are some star clusters uh, that are known to be 12 or 13 billion years old, uh, and they uh, caused some trouble for some values of the Hubble constant until quite recently. Uh, okay, um, so, but then this, uh, this uh, begs a question, namely, uh, what's going to happen in the future? Could it be uh, that the expansion of the universe stops, turns around, and comes back, leading to a big crunch? Another one of these technical terms. Uh, and uh, uh, how much mass would the universe have to contain uh, for that to be true? So let me do that calculation now. This is something we know how to do. This is an escape velocity problem. The universe, you know, you throw, uh, uh, you throw a pen up in the air. If you throw it slowly, it stops, turns around, and comes back. If you throw it fast, it goes away. Or to put it a different way, if you throw a pen up in the air at some velocity, whether it comes back or not depends on the gravitational force of the planet you're standing on, which in turn depends on the mass and the density of that planet. Uh, so if you set your universe into motion, it's expanding outward. Uh, depending on the density of the universe, uh, it can stop, turn around, and fall back, or it can keep going. Uh, 
So here's the calculation. Here's, any, here's, here's us or any other observer. It works no matter where you do. Uh, then there's some, uh, there's some galaxy, some distance d away from us. Uh, it's moving outwards at a rate of uh, some velocity v, where v is related to d uh, by this uh, 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 equation. Second for megaparsec, that's right. Uh, and then uh, what's trying to pull it back? Well, the mass inside of this region is trying to hold it back. It's only the mass inside of that region because the mass uh, outside of a region, we talked about this in the context of planets, this all cancels out. Uh, and so uh, what is the escape velocity? So the escape velocity, you may recall, is the square root of uh, what? 2 g m over d. That's the escape velocity of this object. Now let me make sure I haven't screwed this up. No, that's right. Uh, and so the question is, is v greater than v escape? All right. So let's evaluate this. What's m? m is equal to uh, uh, the density times the volume. Density, we'll call that, uh, give it its usual symbol of rho. And the volume is 4 thirds pi d cubed. That's the volume of this sphere of material. And, and you'll see why I translate it into density in a minute. Uh, the velocity is equal to h times d. So the question is, is h times d greater than the square root of 2g over d times the mass, rho 4 thirds pi d cubed. All right, let's square both sides. I've got to get rid of this, uh, 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 this square root sign. So h squared d squared uh, is h squared d squared greater than 2g rho 4 thirds pi. And, and we've got uh, d cubed divided by d, so that's d squared. And here's the key thing. The d's cancel. The distance cancel. It doesn't matter which galaxy you pick. Uh, it doesn't matter how far away that galaxy is. You get the exact same result for every portion of the universe you examine. So. The question becomes, is the density less than 3h squared over 8 pi g? I've just rearranged the terms. Uh, this is the row. It's still on the less than side. I've taken the uh, 2 times 4 is 8. That's this 8. There's a pi. That goes down here. This 3 comes over on top. And the, h not and the h squared stays where it is. So this quantity is defined as the critical density. If the density of the universe is less than the critical density, the universe expands forever. If the density of the universe is greater than the critical density, then the universe recollapses. So uh, we can calculate this. Uh, this is all constants on this right-hand side. Uh, we've measured h. We've measured h, so we know what that is. Three times two times ten to the minus eighteen. That's h. Uh, we work that out squared uh, over eight pi times seven times ten to the minus eleven. Uh, and now it's just arithmetic. And, and I'll tell you the answer. We, you can work it out for yourself. Uh, I got 6 times 10 to the minus 27, and this is in units of kilograms per meter cubed. That's a really small density. It doesn't take much to hold the universe back. On the other hand, the universe is really big. Uh, obviously, the density of, of, of this room, of the air in this room, is you know, 20, uh, is 30 orders of magnitude bigger. That's why the Earth isn't expanding. 
because we're so dense that our little region of the universe has turned around and recollapsed long since. But if you take the universe as a whole, planets are rare, stars are rare, galaxies even are rare. And it turns out, as we'll discuss next time, uh, that the universe is actually fairly close uh, in bulk. If you take a large enough region that includes all the empty space, it turns out that the average density of the universe is actually surprisingly close to this critical value at which the universe will be balanced between expanding forever and recollapsing. And so we'll talk about how you actually measure the average density of the universe and thus determine the fate of the universe uh, next time.